All right, so it's going to be an ad hoc video. It's not the official official, <coughs> but um, you know we'll edit it and we'll make a proper one later. We haven't got the GoPro ready for us today. All right, so let's start by looking at wind shear, which is one of the things that's been a problem because oftentimes, and it's a facility like this, when guys come here, we assume that they are proficient in wind shear and wind shear operations. And 99% of the times, they're not. They've got no idea what wind shear is about. They come from flying school, and you say you get too cold, you have a bit of an ice bear. They come from school, and they talk to about thunderstorms and frontal systems and blah, 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 but they don't tell them anything about wind shear really. They say, oh, this is wind shear, but you don't really get to know what wind shear is about until the day you end up in wind shear. And then you go, oh, fuck. Um, that happened to me, and then I got killed with wind shear once. So, <coughs> looking at wind shear, Stop like it's wind shear, wind shear's definition, Dallas incident, planes in which wind shear takes place. Um, then we've got momentum. I didn't pass school because it right nicely, but it felt so sorry for me that they put me on. Um, momentum, uh, we've got positive and negative, then we've got hints for wind shear, then we've got one, two, three, plan, then we've got uh, watch out for, or look out for, and then we've got wind shear, avoid, recover. In between here, yeah, we've got the <coughs> when she detection as well. Now I'm not gonna. I won't wipe out any anything. And when the board is full, and I'll, and I'll tell you when I'm ready to wipe out, then you can snap a pick or so, and then I'll or make notes. Doesn't matter. Then it's okay. In between, yeah, I should have put yeah, when she detection. All right. Now we're specifically going to look at when she under 145, which can be similar to yours, except. That wind shear 145 has got wind shear guidance on the computer. It'll automatically go into the guidance mode. You're going to do it manually. So you're a lot more at risk um, because you've got a lot less tools that you can use. I don't know about the ATR, the ATR looks never fun ATR in my life. This thing has got all the tools in it, or almost all except for predictive wind shear. So the first thing <coughs> is the definition of wind shear it is a sudden change or abrupt. in wind speed and or direction. It will be speed or direction, what can be a combination of the two. Now if we look at wind direction, it's simple. If we look at something like a temperature inversion, the wind above the inversion layer and the wind below the inversion layer are oftentimes two different directions. It might be the same direction or similar direction but different speeds. So you've got a 10 knot wind, I get a 50, you've got a 50 knot wind, down here you've got a 10 knot wind. Can it, can it also be, uh, let's say, one uh, updraft and one downdraft? So yeah, we're going to get to that one. That's going to be in the planes of wind shear. <clears throat> the planes where wind shear is, is, can happen. So in this case, if we are coming in, and the temperature inversion, remember, it's got quite a, quite a small layer or, or um, a thin area over which the wind changes between the two because of the inversion layer. So let's say you're coming in here at 130 knots <coughs> um, airspeed. The second you go through here, that's a 50 knot headwind that you've had. That 50 knot headwind then drops away, makes 10 knots. So you've got a minus 40 on your, on your left speed. That will instantaneously drop you, depending on how thin that layer is, will drop you to like 90 knots. That's wind shear. It will fall out the sky. One of the problems with, with um, something like a temperature inversion is when do you expect violent things to happen is when things are violent, like thunderstorms and stuff. But this is a temperature inversion. Everything is quiet and calm in a temperature inversion, but it can really bite you in the ass. Uh, you can also have wind changes. Remember, the tower does not give us wind 3,000 feet above ground. You only have the wind there we are. Now, I don't know about the ATR again, you can pick it up on the GPS, but you've got to physically go into programming there to pick up on the GPS what the wind's doing and compare it to what you're getting, which is very difficult. 
on something like a 145, it automatically shows you the directions and that, that's much easier. So, you've got to watch out for that. So, it's wind speed and or direction that can that can bite you with um, wind shear. Now, there was a situation, I think it was a TriStar or an L1011, I can't remember the aeroplane. And um, it was there in Dallas a bunch of years ago. And uh, the guys took off there. Unfortunately, at that stage, it was late 70s, early 80s. Unfortunately, that uh, those days, they didn't know about wind shear. It was an unknown thing. There are a lot of low-level wind phenomena and um, a lot of things that happened wrong. Well, those things, a lot of incidents and accidents low level, and it was all related to wind. So in Dallas, it happened the one time <coughs> that I think it was an L1011 or a TriStar, sorry. Um, anyway, so the guys took off here, and there was a localized effect, a localized uh, activity, which they didn't know at that stage. Nowadays, you know, it's a, as a microburst, they didn't know that it was. They took off over here. Climbing out, I think it was 196 knots the climbing out there. Now, if you look at the microburst, it's got quite a strong outflow. Yeah. This outflow was 80 knots, which mm -hmm. is hectic. So these guys got themselves stuck here. The set, first thing is they hit the first part of it, which had a, a big headwind. That headwind ate the momentum of the airplane. Now, we'll get to momentum just now because the momentum actually plays a very, very important. If it wasn't for momentum, we would not experience wind shear. So they hit the headwind over here, the headwind slowed them down, re they reduced the momentum that they've got. Then they went through sort of the side of this thing, and when they went out the back side, this 18 knot tailwind hit them, so they ended up with, I think it's 116 knots below stall speed. Stalled, went to the left, crashed into, into the fuel bowels, all got killed. Mm -hmm. So FA, Yasa, Anak, all these guys said, listen, this low level wind shear things that's taking place is a big problem for us, we need to solve this. So they did a lot of investigation and eventually they ended up putting dynes and pneumometers all around these airfields where they usually get this kind of phenomenon. Then they connected these to a central computer system. The central computer system was then programmed to look for certain wind changes, wind speed changes, direction changes, and when it passes a threshold, the computer would then say, wait a minute, there's problems with the airfield. <coughs> and then the ATC could then send a warning out to the crew. Nowadays, Things are so advanced, there's some predictive wind shear where they can tell you where the wind shear is expected to come from. So things have changed quite a lot. Now, um, with all that said and done, that was the Dallas, the, the Dallas incident, which was the catalyst for the wind shear movement, if you could like call it like. Now, the problem with wind shear is we cannot quantify wind shear. You don't get a blue Bravo 3 Delta wind shear. It's just wind shear. You get into it. It's an unknown quantity. You might get into it lightly. You might get into it heavy. It might be light going heavy, going light. It might stay heavy. It might stay light. We don't know. We've got no idea. So we ex actually don't want to go in there. But if we do want to, go, if we do have to go in there, we need a bit of planning. So we need to prepare ourselves. Now, um, the planes of wind shear that can, that can take place in is the vertical plane, which is up and down rafts. The lateral plane which is crosswinds, so left and right. But the worst one is the four aft axis, which is headwind, tailwind. That's the worst one, because the headwind, tailwind situation, this is all the S-pitch. Ah, but screws the s -pitch. If you've got crosswinds, it doesn't screw with your s -pitch that much. The problem is, it's all about the airflow over the wings. And if there's not enough airflow over the wings, you've got a problem. If you're flying something with a swept wing, like a swept-wing jet, it's a bit of a different story. It will influence the airplane a little bit. But the worst is a four aft wind changes, because that's where the wind is over the wing or not over the wing. That's where we get to momentum. Momentum is the resistance to change of an object with mass. Now, if we could change, if the momentum did not exist, if we could change our speed at the same rate at which the airspeed changes, there would be no wind shear. Because as the wind would change, we would change. But due to momentum, we have wind shear. So, in that, there's a there's big debate about positive and negative wind shear, but it doesn't matter what the debate is about, it's about how it works. Now, if you have any wind or wind phenomena that uh, that makes the apparent performance of the aeroplane to increase, like a tailwind or wind from below, pushing us up or pushing us faster forward, that's called positive wind shear. So, it's increasing wind shear. So, what that does is... If I was going to land over there where the, where the wall intersects the ground and I've got positive wind shear, it's going to boost me to land over there. I don't want to land there, I want to land here. So what am I going to do? Put the nose down, close it up, go close the thrust. I'm going to refer to thrust to this exercise. 
<coughs> Conversely, any wind phenomena that makes the apparent performance of the airplane to decrease is called negative wind chill. So, if I'm flying into a headwind that's increasing, it's going to push me down lower. So I'm not going to land there where I'm planning. I'm going to land over here. So what do I do? Rise down and ample thrust. This is a much better position to be in. In any case, it's a headwind. This is a much better position in to be in this one. Because this one, low nose, and we've got low thrust setting or low power setting. For certification processes, perform second second performance airplanes, it takes eight seconds from idle to max thrust. Eight seconds sounds like a long time, but when you're falling out the sky, eight seconds is not a long time. Ask me, I know. Was going into a place called Tepuitu years ago. We had we scud rounded out over the sea and back in again. Typically legal contract operation. Um, came in over the sea and we were a thousand feet above ground and we were on final approach and we were fighting this thing. And it was a massive storm. Mm -hmm. And um, it's about two and a half hours flight north of, of um, Beirut. And on final approach, the next moment it was like God brought the earth to us. It just came up like us. We saw it, we threw in all the thrust, didn't make a difference. The earth just kept on coming. We thought we were going to hit the water. We were planning to hit the water and hopefully bounce far enough, if we could bounce, to end up on the beach to hit the airplane. That's how bad it was. I grabbed it. My co pilot as well. <coughs> and the guys in the back, they started drinking and praying. They were miners from South Africa. Hang on. <coughs> anyway, so it doesn't matter which way around we, we see this. This is negative, this part, the, don't care. The point is, this will cause us to be in a worse situation because of tailwind and updraft and low power setting, low nose. This will be better for us because it's a headwind, downdraft, and high power setting, high nose. So you're in a better position to get out of it at this stage than you are at this stage. Just a quick question. How, how large can that wind shear area actually be? Massive. Good. Massive. The thing with wind shear is if you are high up in, the, in altitude, it usually is vertical winds. If you've got like, if we're talking specifically about rain effects and stuff like that, you can get clear turbulence, which is just about wind shear because the wind changes in such a way that either the aircraft's wing due to increase in fall and forward uh, or increase in headwind boosts and goes up or it gets a tailwind that falls down. You know, people talk about pockets. It's not a pocket, it's an area where the tail, where the headwind is reduced or the tailwind is increased. That's what a pocket is, because all you do is you lose lift. Or you can get it the up and down drop as well. Mm. Now, we don't necessarily know, unless you're flying and you're watching your predictive speed, and this thing has got a predictive speed measurement device, so it will tell you where you're going to be in the next couple of seconds to speed. If you watch that, you will see it going up and down. <coughs> and that'll then indicate to us headwind tailwind as opposed to maybe an up drop down drop which you'll see on the vertical speed. So if you're flying high and we're flying in an area where these things happen with clear turbulence, then we watch and you will see it because what is clear turbulence? It's when they change direction all the time. It can be up, down, crosswinds, can be anything. And all that influences because it influences the amount of airflow that goes over the wings, which influences the flying ability of the airplane. Right. So your problem with wind shear is if it's up in a high altitude, you've got altitude to play with. If you're here by the ground, the wind goes down, it has to go sideways. It doesn't go down, it all goes in one direction. It falls down due to the weight of the air and it spreads out in, in all directions. Hmm. If you are somewhere inside there, your only way out is having is experiencing a tailwind because the wind is going out from you. Now, I don't know exactly how that <coughs> on that day what took place, but we, hit, um, we got into a tailwind situation. Fortunately, the tailwind stopped before it dropped all the, all the speed of our wings. Thank goodness. So, if you say momentum, if I'm flying at 100 knots, and there's a wall of air here that flows at 100 knots in my direction, but this is wind still. I fly like this and I go into that wall of air. My instantaneous indication of speed will be 200 knots, because I'm flying at 100 and this wind's blowing out. So I go into that, so my first indication will be 200 knots. My thrust vector still is the same, but my drag has now doubled because I've got 200 knots forward speed as opposed to 100 that I'm set up for. If I could increase my thrust so that it can make 200 knots, then I would be in equilibrium and I will still be flying at 100 knots, which is not the case. So we hit this, this wall of air. The airplane doesn't go and stops the wall of air. It goes into it, and over a period of time, it'll get back to where the drag is equal to the thrust, and it's back in equilibrium. It takes time for that to happen. That is the momentum. Now, if I am flying in this wind that's blowing at 100 knots, and I'm standing still in relation to the air. My plane does not have momentum. Mm -hmm. If I leave the wind, I fall out the sky. Yes. <clears throat> if I have a tailwind, let's say, of 100 knots. Mm -hmm. So now I'm flying 100 knots. The wind is blowing 100 knots. So I'm flying at 200 knots in relation to the earth, but I'm still flying 100 knots in relation to the air mass. If I now take 100 knots away, I've got momentum. It will still travel for a bit and then will regain and continue flying. Yes. 
Okay, Converse. Right. Now, uh, you want to snap a pick or can I, can I take it off? I can take it off if you have a handle. Sure, okay. <laughs> Now, we're going to do the mental preparation briefing after this one. I want to do this one first because I'm going to record this and give it to Theodora so she can, can have a look at it at home. Um, because the mental preparation one is vitally, critically important and we're going to do this after this. All right. <clears throat> now, hints. Oftentimes, we can know that we could expect weather or expect um, wind shear in advance, days in advance. Why do I say that? Because when you get the weather reports, they say next week thunderstorms expected Wednesday. You can expect winds here. It's one of the first places you get winds in. So what do the guys do? Oh, okay, we're expecting thunderstorms next week. Okay, so the bulls, the sharks playing today. What time are they playing? Instead of going, okay, we're expecting winds here next week because there's a thunderstorm. Oftentimes, and this will tie in with the mindset briefing, oftentimes, more often than not, when we pull the key out the ignition of the airplane, we think flying's over. Flying's not over. That's only half the job. The rest of the job is going home and getting mentally prepared for what can happen to me tomorrow. Because we don't know what might happen. If we're not mentally ready for it, we might get caught out. Hmm. If that's the next bit, we'll do it just now when Theodora comes. All right. Um, jeans. Okay, with that. okay, the hints for winch here. Yeah. <coughs> hints for winch is doing like this. So anything that could give you a possible idea that you might experience winch here. Yeah. Now you can have a day's ahead of time. If you're expecting high winds, you can have a day's ahead of time. So if we're looking at the hints, point number one, hint is thunderstorms. Point number two is gusty conditions. Now there are runways where you can expect gusty conditions in any way, where it's normal for us to get gusty conditions. Mm -hmm. One of them is the Comoros Islands, mm -hmm. Maroni specifically. Mm -hmm. I had a very bad wind shear incident there. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very bad. Not, not as bad as the one I had at Tequiti, but quite bad. So, just to the west, it's an island. <clears throat> the wind almost always comes from the west. And just to the west of the airfield, there's a sheer rock face goes down to the, to the sea. So, as the wind's coming in from the west, it goes over that and it tumbles. A place like this will have gusty conditions in any way. It will mask the symptoms and the signs for wind shear. So, you must be extra vigilant in places like this. Okay. But if you're flying in Joburg, it's not usually a place where wind tumbles around. It's usually a place where the wind is just flying normally. So if you do get things with wind shear there, then you know, okay, this is wind shear. So the signs are very, uh, it's a lot more easy to recognize. You get something like a funnel effect. Now, that's not wind shear, wind shear, hard wind shear. But here to the north, we've got a dam called Artemisburg Dam. And there's two mountains, the northern reach, two parts of the northern reach. There's no viewing from the side. There's a bridge there, and the bikes and cars going over the bridge. And what oftentimes happens is wind comes from the north during certain times of the year. Now, these two mountains, if I look at it from the top now, as the wind is coming from the north, because it goes through this port, it's a wind venturi. Mm -hmm. So the airspeed will increase as it's going through there. So the weekend warriors, when they're flying with their RV7s going through here, this doesn't bother them so much because it's headwind and it's increasing headwind. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Now, when they come back after they've done what they want to do, fly with their friends or whatever, when they come back and they pass through here, because this wind increases quite a lot over a very short period of time, they experience wind shearing. Mm -hmm. There's been a number of incidents and accidents with microlights, paragliders, and things like that, things like this. They don't think about it. The wind's blowing. Funnel effect could, could cause it to us. Just low level over all over mountainous areas. Better. Yeah, it's a bad idea, especially with aircraft and things that are not good to handle it. Hang gliders, paragliders, things like a collapse canopy is not a good idea. Rotor cloud, this primary example, rotor cloud, when the guys come this side, the leeward side, the wind needs them and cold folds up the canopy. <coughs> okay, so there's, <coughs> there's a whole bunch of these things. Can I wipe this? Mm -hmm. There's a whole bunch of these things, but we're going to focus, focus on the main ones. Now, you get something called local effect, which is similar to final effect. Now, when you're at Lanceria, back in the day, um, we used to get quite strong winds in August. You'll only know that we get winds in August if you know South Africa, if you know, if you know the Joburg area. Your weather predictions might tell you that, and the uh, weather reports will tell you that, but we know already, you know, we've operated here for a long time. So we know <clears throat> that we get these winds. 
Now, then what happens, runway 07 near Lanseria, you've got these buildings, and the wind comes, and the wind passes through the sides of the buildings, and it gets blocked over the buildings, causing wind shear. But we know about it because we know the wind, the wind is going to do that. Okay, that's local effect. Then we get the three family members. Microburst. Definition of microburst, the diameter is less than five nautical miles. Duration is less than five minutes in duration. <coughs> a frog in my throat. Microburst could be either a standalone microburst there in the distance, or it could be embedded in a thunderstorm, a larger thunderstorm activity, or it could be embedded in Altostratus mammatus, hmm. where it's a fairly stable cloud, but you can get this inside it and you'll notice know, the radar is a red or yellow dot, and you'll see underneath it there's a shaft of rain coming out. So either in a lone, standing alone, or inside another thunderstorm, or part of Altostratus mammatus. Right. Then you've got a macro burst. One guy very cleverly, I was discussing this, and I said, What's what's the definition of a macro burst? So he said in the back of the class, he said, It's bigger than a micro burst. So I know, but what's the definition? Right. So definition of a macro burst is the diameter is more than five nautical miles and more than five minutes in duration. Just a bigger, bigger than a microburst. If you look at the square kilometer size inside each one of these and you compare the intensity to each other, you'll see the intensity is the same. <clears throat> but wait, I've got a brother. He's a sister. I've got a brother. Her name is Virga. Mm -hmm. Now, Virga, for the same square centimeter size, is a lot more aggressive. Right, it's a good Virga. So what happens with Virga? Virga rains, but the water doesn't reach the ground. It re-evaporates, goes back in the cloud. Mm -hmm. Leaving very cold, very dense, <coughs> very dry air, very heavy below it, that falls quite quickly. A lot quicker than microburst and macroburst. Now microburst and macroburst have both got moisture laden in air. Remembering that the molecule of water weighs less than a molecule of air. Mm -hmm. So... Humid as humidity goes up, the performance of the plane goes down because the air's density is less. <clears throat> in the winter, you'll notice your car performs better than the summer. Why? Because the air is cold. Especially you've got a turbo car. Then it even makes quite a bit of difference in temperature. So why does this happen? <clears throat> now, your body's natural temperature regulating mechanism is sweat. So what happens? Your sweat glands emit water. The water touches your skin. The water then takes on some of your skin's temperature and it evaporates, taking that temperature with it. So it drops your body of temperature. Mm -hmm. So if you're standing dry like this, and you have a fan blowing in you, you'll be okay. But if you wet yourself with a t-shirt, you put a fan in you, you're going to get cold real quick. Because there's a lot of molecules of, of water leaving your body, leaving your shirt, that's got your temperature. And your body then has to work extra hard to get the temperature back. Mm -hmm. right. <clears throat> it's called latent heat of evaporation. Now, how does that happen with Virga? In the first place, when we increase our altitude, our temperature decreases. Mm -hmm. So what happens when we decrease altitude? The temperature increases. Mm -hmm. Bringing this air-water mixture to a point where the water evaporates, stealing the air's temperature, going back in the cloud, leaving cold, dry, dense, heavy air that will accelerate quite fast to the ground. Okay. But wait, that's not all. I sound like a very mock salesman. Mm -hmm. Over here, the QNH might be 995. Down here, the QNH might be 1025. So if I've got a balloon, at this altitude, the balloon's going to be that big. Over here, the balloon's going to be that big. The total calorie value of the energy inside that balloon is still the same, but it's occupying less space. So <clears throat> if I would take a square centimeter out of that balloon and a square centimeter out of this balloon, the square centimeter here's temperature will be higher because more energy is concentrated in there due to it being pressed, compressed into a smaller area. But wait, that's not all. Very much 
Due to the compression, the friction forces will as well raise the temperature of the air, which further gets it to the point where it evaporates, the water evaporates, goes back in the cloud, leaving cold, dry, dense, heavy air behind that forces the ground really quickly. But wait, that's still not all. <coughs> in a day, you get shortwave radiation going into the earth, heating up the earth and heating up the uh, rural areas, the buildings are in. At night, you get long wave radiation going out, but the, all that still causes a hotter area closer to the ground, relatively more than higher up in the air. Again, bringing this water, water laden air, up to the point where it starts to re evaporate, and that re evaporation then takes the temperature of the air, puts it back into the cloud, and the air stays behind cold, dry, dense, and accelerates fast to the ground, but it's very heavy. That is why Virgo is a lot more worse than micro or macro burst um, in when it rains. So Virgo for the same physical size and dimensions and, and quantity of, of liquid, quantity of water and air, is a lot more violent. Okay. The last one is a period. Depends on if you're American or British. It's a pie ramp or a pie ramp pilot report. Yeah. Trainer one, last aircraft reported to win on short finals. Wada, 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 wada. Okay, can I wipe this out? Okay. There's a lot of memories I wish I could wipe out of my brain, but okay. <coughs> you never experienced the Virga, aren't you? No, I haven't experienced Virga. I've stayed clear of, of any microburst and macroburst that I, and Virga that I could see. Um, <coughs> earlier years, I didn't get the opportunity. We already knew not to fly through it. I didn't know why until I got up in Winshire. And then I started doing investigation about Winshire and I did a lot of reading and research and stuff. And then we come up with this stuff. But I've never been in Virgo or something like that. But the, the premise is, what if there's Virgo at the airfield? You know, the guys don't often think about that that might be a threat to them. Wait, let it go away. And we'll discuss it as well now, what we're going to do about it. Okay, so, one, two, three, plan. Land, hold, or divert. Ideally, we do not want to land in windshear conditions. If this room, if I say to you and the lights are off in this room, if I say to you, this room are full of bandidos, there's 10 of them inside here, and they all got guns. How inclined are you going to open this door? We're not going to open the door, we're going to leave the door. So, especially worse, if we don't even know how many bandidos are in here and what weapons they carry. That's like windshield. We don't know how bad it's going to be. What the hell are we doing inside windshield? If we don't have to land in windshield, stay away. Go somewhere else. <clears throat> we don't know. That might be the last time we're going to experience windshield. So, three things. If you can hold, let's say there's a microburst to a macroburst to a bit of burger, or a thunderstorm that's just busy passing. If you can hold, and especially if there was a warning for windshield, if you can hold, go hold somewhere. Wait for it to dissipate. Once it's gone, come and approach if it's not it going to go away, if it's going to stay there, then divert. If it's like a severe thunderstorm, then divert. Don't, don't stay around there. I know the company's going to squeal, and you're going to have to follow the risk management model. What are you going to do with the clients? What are you about fuel, etc., etc.? But rather not going to something that's dangerous than going to something that's dangerous and might kill you. There's a site called the Aviation Safety Network. You can go and look there and then win, search windshear wind incidents and accidents on there. We're also going to do it in the next briefing. So it's Aviation Safety Network. <clears throat> if I'm not mistaken, if you go and search um, wind shear and aircraft, you'll find quite a lot of incidents and accidents there. The problem is these things don't happen to you every day. It happens every couple of years. But if it happens to you, you're not mentally prepared for it. It might be the last time it's going to happen. Hmm. That's the problem. <clears throat> right. So land, hold and divert. If you have to land, in the first place, your four best friends with wind shear is this. <clears throat> Altitude. Early recognition, indicated airspeed, and in, I'm going to refer to the to the rare 145. Instead of landing on a flap 45, land flap 22. Okay, so your four friends: it's altitude, early recognition, indicated airspeed, and lower flap setting. <coughs>
The first one should be early recognition. The quicker you can recognize it, the earlier you recognize wind shear, the better, the better chance you have to get out of it. It will lead to high altitude recognition of storm. <clears throat> That's the first thing. And oftentimes, you know, we see it here in some like that. I've been doing only some training. This is what I do. My, my whole life revolves around training. That's what I do. I get up in the morning to train. It rotates my beacon. If you tell me to the Cape Town, I go, oh. If you tell me to go for some session, I'm happy. I go, so. I joke with the guys here. I say, drill a hole on the side of the sim. Throw four beers, one hamburger. Four beers, one hamburger. Leave me inside. Don't even, don't even open the door. Just let the other guys get in there, but I'll stay inside. So, um, altitude is going to be your first best thing. And that is going to be through early recognition. Now, we've had it hundreds of times. So now we've done the wind shear briefings. We told the guys what to expect. We explained them how it's going to happen. Get in the simulator. Through his book, I can see all the signs taking place. They don't see it until the wind shear, wind shear warning comes up. Wind shear, wind shear, wind shear. Ah, uh, wind shear. Dude, it's been out there for like last five seconds. You could have reacted a long time ago. But we don't look at it. Because every day we fly, especially in this machine, there are certain instruments we don't really look at. Every day we fly, everything goes okay. So we're used to that set of circumstances. So for us to see things outside that set of circumstances, it's not going to be easy. But that's what we need to look out for. If you hear... If you think there's going to be wind shear, do is look out for things that are related to wind shear and plan for it. And we can do it a week in advance. You can do it on final approach. This one of mine happened on final approach. I'll talk to you about it just now. Early recognition gives you a higher altitude. Higher altitude gives you more space. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the five most useless things, or the four most useless things in aviation is altitude above you, fuel in the bowser, runway behind you, and the freaking co-pilot forgot to take the air assist telephone. It's the four most useless things in aviation. Right. Indicated e speed. The higher e speed you have, the better chances you have. Now, you can go anything from 10 to 20, depending on your aircraft's limitations, on indicated e speed. So, if you're final approach, add more speed. Also, go for reduced flap, because if you go for flap 45, it's a lot of effort, it's a lot of drag to get out of there. If you go with the flap 22, you already have a higher speed, point 0.1. Point 0.2, you've got indicated e speed, you can increase more on top of that. Point number three, you've got a lot less drag. Four friends in wind shear. <clears throat> Ideally, we never ever want to take off in wind shear unless someone is shooting us. There was that case, was it ADC <coughs> or ADJ Airlines in Abuja 2016? I think they crashed yeah. on takeoff in known wind shear. They took off known wind shear, killed 100 people. If they knew anything about wind shear, they wouldn't have taken off. They would have stayed on the ground, waited for it to dissipate, then took off. Cost 100 people's lives. Hmm. Um, it was 2016, right? Yeah, yeah. Out of Abuja. 737, yeah. 800 or 600. 800. 600. 600. Yeah, NG. Yeah. Completely unnecessary. And if you look at, we'll do it in the next briefing. If you can look at the Aviation Safety Network, the bulk of the incidents, accidents, someone didn't do something correctly or they didn't think for themselves. That's what they ended up in an accident situation. <laughs> it's very rare that the airplane itself breaks in such a way that you cannot do anything about. Very rare. It's, it's people either being incorrectly trained making incorrect decisions, um, not looking out for things that are threats for them, etc., 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 etc. All right, <clears throat> can I wipe this? All right. Now, what is it? Look out for. So, you are flying with the chief pilot of the company. He's got four bars to his shoulder. He's got four bars to his ear. He's got bars down his arm, down his leg, and across his foot. <laughs> okay, so he's the man. And uh, he flies the boss's wife around, plays, plays golf with the shareholders of the company. Even if he's flying with you, do not assume he knows anything about wind shear. Because I can tell you from personal experience, very few pilots know anything about wind shear. Senior guys, guys with thousands of hours, got no idea what wind shear is about. They've just been lucky to get out of it until that one day. Right. So, there are six items that we can look at. Now, when you fly with someone else, it doesn't matter who it is, remembering that the second we walk into a cockpit, there's no sex, there's no color, there's no race, there's no pleases, there's no thank yous, there's no uh, manners, there's no etiquette, there's one thing, one thing only. Two people flying the airplane safely from point A to point B with the passenger side using the SOP, emergency items, and QRH. That's it. There's nothing else. Any emotion involvement mm -hmm. can be detrimental to the flight. Mm -hmm. Any. We are robots, we are machines. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we're human beings, so we do have feelings. Mm -hmm. But we're supposed to be machines. We're there to, to do a task like a Swiss watch. Do this, do this, do this. That's it. 
Don't get offended if someone calls you at the altitude or anything like that. So do not assume. And if you do query the person next to you, it doesn't matter how little hours you have and how much hours they have got. If you query them and say, you must make sure. So Mr. Pilot assisting, what are you going to look for in this situation? Because we are expecting wind shear. Now we already saw we can expect wind shear. What are you going to look for to call me? Wind shear, go around, do not reconfigure. And if he goes, what are you? Oh, then you must know there's no CRM. You're supposed to that. You are just ensuring that the other person is on the same page with you are. You're supposed to do that. The other person takes offense, they don't understand CRM. Okay. <clears throat> First of all, indicated e-speed fluctuations of plus minus 15 knots. It could be either a fluctuation up, fluctuation down, or total fluctuation spanning 15 knots. Vertical speed. Plus or minus 500 feet per minute. Either fluctuation up, fluctuation down, or a total fluctuation of 500 foot a minute. Now in Maroni, you're going to get that. It looks like that in Maroni. So it masks the effects of wind shear in Maroni. <clears throat> Number three, a very much missed one. Okay. Localizer, one dot move. <laughs> and glide slope, one dot move. Now, the first example we'll look at is once again temperature inversion coming in with a 50 knot headwind into an area of a 10 knot headwind. Coming in on final approach, going from a 50 knot wind to the 10 knot wind, you're losing 40 knots. Guess what's going to happen? The plane's going to fall out the sky first until it recovers the speed. So, what's going to happen? The glide slope. For everything else staying the same, you'll drop it to the glide slope. <clears throat> in Maroni, I was out there, the wind was freaking howling that day. It's the weirdest thing ever. So there's Maroni Airport, the wind was blowing 27, gusting 35 on a day. I was doing line train. What, 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 120, the rear 120. Looks like the 145, you know the 120? Yes. Okay. So I came into this thing. Now I'm going to shift things around a little bit later just to, to make an example. But there was a fire right here by the tip of the runway and the smoke was blowing inside the grass. The smoke didn't even come out the grass. You just saw the grass was like hazy, so the wind was freaking howling. So I wasn't too worried about this one. But lo and behold, on final approach, you saw another fire, about two, three kilos behind the runway, and it was blowing in the opposite direction. Right. Yeah. So we had to assume somewhere between these two, there's a shear face. Somewhere the wind has to change direction. So let's just say for argument's sake, this what fire was here. The shear face is over there. So I'm coming in the ILS, I'm positioned for wind. I'm coming in, coming in, coming in. The second I pass through the shear face, this wind blowing in the opposite direction will boost me off the center line. Hmm. But everything else staying the same. Rather do a go around for a suspected wind shear, and this turned out it was not wind shear, than not do a go around, and it is wind shear. We want to be on this side of the TV, not that side. Always go around. Always go around. The problem that we have is it's a cultural thing. And it's an airline, it's a, it's a pilot thing. Whenever we do a go around, the boss said, what did you do wrong Did you do the go around? Dude, put your wife and child with me in the airplane. Would you like me to do the go arounds or continue flying? He's going to say, no, no, get to go arounds. Shut up, leave me alone. Okay. There are always two things that are diametrically opposed. The bean counters and safety. If bean counters are winning, the safety is losing. If safety is winning, the bean counters are losing. It is a business, but we still have to be safe. <laughs> All right. Erratic thrust settings. Uh, 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 trying to stay on the final approach on the glide slope. That it ties in with vertical speed and indicating the speed fluctuations. First signs, get out of there. It's also a hint if you've got gusty conditions in the ground, I can't remember we had it. If you have gusty conditions in the ground, you can expect wind shear because gusty conditions goes as wind shear. The last two is abnormal. Pitch or speed on final approach. So let's just say in your airplane, normal day, max all up landing, let's say for argument's sake with your landing flap, <coughs> you've got two degrees pitch and you've got 68% power on. And today you have to increase, increase, and eventually get to four degrees and 78%. That's wind shear developed. 
And which one is that? Negative wind chill. Because you've got a raisin now, it's a put more power. Yes. So I prefer that rather than the positive wind chill. But when this happens, what's the next thing that can happen? That wind can die down. So now you've already reduced your momentum because you're flying into this increasing headwind. You've reduced your momentum. Now that wind goes to zero or changes, you will lose that in that speed you had. So if it's a 30 knot headwind that dies down, you lose 30 knots. Mm. Wind shear. Button start, power, attitude, get out of there. Ask questions later. Mm. <coughs> so in this, on this occasion, we're flying in the final approach. We saw the, the wind on the other side. I could still see properly without these things at that stage. And um, saw the wind, and we quickly on final approach briefed. Okay, I was pilot monitoring and all pilot assisting. I think I was pilot flying. So, um, we're sitting there, and we saw that. We quickly briefed. Gavin was the, was, the, was the captain. I said, okay, got to watch this. I'm going to watch for this, 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 this. So, he didn't even have to ask me. I said, I'm going to watch for these things. I'll watch out for this, watch out. So, we were prepared already for going on. We were mentally prepared for it. Our brains visited the situation so our bodies could follow. So, lo and behold, as we went into the flare over here, it was like God grabbed the tail of the airplane and started shaking it like a dog shakes a rag. And it was wild. But we were ready to go around. So immediately put in thrust, got out of there. I felt the wind chill on the mountain before. I remember when I was doing my flight. We're going to do it again. I don't know if we're going to do it tomorrow, but we'll do it again with the wind chill. When we go, I usually do the flyouts on the mountain. And when you do the flyouts, we can do it in flights. And you must maybe just come sit with me anyway, because I fly alone and when I do a flight, it's a four hour flight. <clears throat> all right so coming in this happened and then we promptly did a go around went on the downwind stopped in the middle of the air removed our swirl down and stuck it out the window and we came around and came into the flight now we knew where the shear face was which was over here somewhere so we knew we had to be on the ground before the shear face took place this ties in with, <coughs> with <coughs> if you're flying in a place like maputu you've got a cross runway Preferably, you want to use a runway that's a crosswind component runway rather than headwind downward component, if you can determine it, because crosswinds are not as detrimental to your flying as head downwinds. Head downwinds rub the speed off. Crosswinds will throw you around a little bit, but it wouldn't necessarily so much rub the speed of the wings. So you then like to change to use another runway to get in, so you can have crosswinds rather than headwind downward combinations. All right. So ideally, we don't want to get into wind shear. If we do have an idea that wind shear might be present, don't go there. Stay out. Um, together with that, I don't know what the ATR, what, what the ATR's machine is. The Embraer 145 has got wind shear avoidance guidance taking machinery that will help you get out of it. The 1900, you don't have it. But the problem is, how do you know what speech attitude to follow to get out of there? There's a couple of things. Point number one, whenever wind shear takes place and it deflects your, your wings and it does this with you, you will lose some of your lifts. You must try to maintain wings level at all times. Point, one. Point number two, we don't know what speech attitude to use to get out of there. So the way to use would be respecting the stick uh, of the, uh, the stall warning. Okay, two, two to three seconds in the stall warning, two to three seconds out, two to three in, two to three out, two to three in, two to three out. Because you don't know what the proper approach climb angle is going to be. You might have a, a forward or off C of G that's going to change it. The weight of the airplane is going to change. So we can't say 12 degrees because it might be 14, it might be 9. And that 1 degree might be the one that's going to save you. So you pull it in, get the store warning, push it out. Just go out the store warning, 1, 2, back in the store warning. 1, 2, back out the store warning. 1, 2, back in. That's the only way you're going to get out of there if you've got no other guidance. Mm. Remembering that we do not reconfigure. The reason for that is <clears throat> if you hit the, the ground with the body of the airplane, structural damage is almost certain. But if you hit the wheels, at worst you can bend the frame. Unless you're not really in the dark. Bend the frame, but at least you'll survive. Insurance can pay that out, insurance can't pay lives. <laughs> all right, any questions? This all is part of mental preparation, which is going to be the main, next briefing we're going to do. I'm going to go fix the door and then I think they are, they are there. Mental preparation. We can see from this that we can prepare mentally for wind shear days ahead of time. What do pilots usually do? No, wait till it happens to them. So we can prepare here. By the time we get here, we prepared ourselves, we are ready to do the job. There's two things. There's react and respond. This ties in with, with where is my mind. 
react and respond. <clears throat> now, so you guys know what I look like. So today I come to school with a tennis ball and I walk into the canteen or something and I throw a tennis ball at you and I get you and they go, ah, I got your tennis ball, I may be You're going to go, ah, damn it. What are you going to do when you go home? You're going to go, okay, I've got a plan for tomorrow. It's not going to catch me again. When I get to the parking lot, I'm going to look for his car or his bike, his parking spot. I've got a parking spot so you know where it is. You walk in the front front desk, you talk to the niece. Hi, Denise, how are you? She's so fine. So how's your weekend? No good. Okay, cool. What is that temperature again? 36.2. Um, so I see Nico's car is here. Is he here somewhere in the morning? Oh, yes, he's in the canteen. Oh, he's in the canteen. Does he have a tennis ball with him? Oh, he does. Okay. We know now. Okay, so sign in. Okay, now when you walk up the stairs, if you see Nico, you just say, duck, because you won't get us to the ball. When you're up the stairs, we go past the first briefing room, we check if he's inside, but we hide behind the door. You know, past that, we get to the window there by the canteen. We see Nico, we go, yeah, it's a beer. So what's the difference between the previous day and today? The previous day, you reacted to me throwing the ball at you. Most likely, with a cup of coffee in your hand, you would have, I would have paused it to spill the coffee. The next day, you're responding to it. So you've got a plan of action that if the symptoms fit the ball, you can put that plan of action into place. And that's what's going to make you operate safer because you've planned the whole thing. This is planned and thought out. Same with this. <laughs> if you get into wind scene, you didn't expect it you're most likely going to react to it. We make mistakes when we react because there's no thinking involved or very little. We want to respond to the situation, so that's why we do training. So when we have an engine failure, we should be expecting engine failure at all any times. If we do have an engine failure, we have to respond to it. We don't react to the engine failure. Then we've got a much better chance of survival. Abhi? Okay, any questions? Not yet, they will come. Right. Stop this thing, yeah.